Good day to one and all, and welcome to the show. I have with me today a special guest, uh, two special guests, actually. First guest is a recurring guest on the show, and that's Dr. David Pareka. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me, Dan. Oh, you're welcome. And along with David and I, we have the special guest, Dr. Jeffrey Kotick. He is a researcher of medieval Asia. He's a translator and a writer with a PhD from Leiden University with a specific interest in astrology, Buddhism, Sinology, and history. And today we're going to be talking about cross-cultural currents in astral magic with a focus on the Asian continent for a change. Since so much of my own work is focused on the Latin West, I figured it would be a good time to mix things up and get some other people's perspectives on these currents. So, Jeffrey, I wanted to ask you, your interest is in medieval Asia, and I thought a good way to start this discussion off, was there a Middle Ages in Asia? What does it mean to, to be medieval in Asia? Well, th first of all, thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, as to your question, the definition of medieval and Middle Ages, uh, of course, that's a very Eurocentric conception, but nevertheless, we find it employed in scholarship on East Asia, as well as in South Asia as well. We also speak of medieval India, for example. And generally, the time periods uh, that we speak about correspond roughly to what we see in discussions of Europe and the Near East. So uh, the ancient period of China, for example, many would consider that to run to around the 4th or 5th century. That would be considered late antiqu antiquity China. And then medieval China, um, by a lot of estimations, is from the 5th or 6th century until about the Song Dynasty in the late 10th century. And then it switches over to the imperial period, which runs uh, all the way until the early 20th century when the Qing Dynasty collapses and then the Republic of China arises. Um, Japan has much more fixed definitions of what constitutes the ancient period, medieval period. Um, but again, those conceptions were brought about uh, based on readings of uh, European uh, historiography. So in pre-modern times, obviously, you didn't have people speak of the medieval period. They would have just spoken of past times and they would have um, characterized things primarily by the dynasties. So Chinese history is generally carved up into different dynasties. And it can often be ambiguous because there can be um, simultaneously two, three, four um, dynasties uh, with each of the rulers claiming to be the son of heaven. In my, in my definition, generally, I treat the medieval period as running generally from the sixth century until the uh, 10th century, although I sometimes extend that loosely up until the uh, Ming Dynasty, um, which collapsed in the uh, mid 17th century. Um, just the corpus of literature is generally uh, consistent. I sort of think of it as from the 6th century until the Jesuits show up. That's how I generally treat it. So it more or less corresponds to uh, the European framework. Right. And then presumably in Japan and in India, it, it would follow a similar framework or would it be staggered in some direction? It really depends on the author. And so there's there's a lot of discussion of what constitutes medieval. Should we use the term medieval when we're discussing Asian polities or Asian civilizations? Because this is a very Eurocentric approach. But at the same time, too, you know, the definition of the Middle Ages and medieval and dark ages, too. I mean, that's also been challenged, too, in, in European history, of course. If I could just jump in and, and one, I'm wondering how Korea fits into that scheme. Korea would generally, f the, Kore the history of Korea generally follows the different kingdoms and the dynasties. So, and then if you're talking right. about the medieval period, then generally it would follow the wider historiography of East Asia. Okay, thank you. So I think the main event of what people really want to hear us talk about today is the reception of foreign astral magic in China. So when we talk about astral magic in China, what do we mean by astral magic in this context? Is it the use of talismans, of sacrifices, of planetary prayers? What's involved with this practice? That's a very good question. So if we go back to the early period of uh, Indian Buddhism as it's being transmitted into China, in the uh, early fourth century, there was a translation of the Shardula Karna Avadana, which is a Buddhist text. 
And uh, this text is rather unique because it has a sort of encyclopedia of uh, lore attached to it. And part of that includes information about astrology as well as the uh, lunar mansions, the nakshetras, the 28 lunar mansions. And so it does state that sacrifices are uh, made to the gods. So Kirtika, one of the lunar stations, which corresponds roughly to the Pleiades, is ruled by Agni, the god of fire. And so you, there's a special sacrifice that you make to Agni. Uh, and by extension also to Kritika, the lunar mansion. And so at that point, we see the first sort of interest in uh, worshipping of astral deities in China, in a Chinese Buddhist context, rather. And then in subsequent centuries, other texts, such as the Mahasamnipata and other works, include information about the zodiac signs. But it's not enough that you could actually practice astrology with this. It's also the definitions of the lunar mansions are given in parameters that would have been alien to the Chinese at the time, because the lunar mansions in India were originally measured with muhurta. The day and the night are divided into altogether 30 muhurta, and that's the um, passage of the moon. So, but for the Chinese, they measured everything uh, with degrees based on the uh, lunar mansions of their own uh, native astronomy. And I should note that the 28 lunar mansions of Chinese astronomy are different from the Indian uh, 28 lunar mansions. The parameters, the definitions were originally completely different, although inevitably the Chinese equated them as the same. They just used their lunar mansions as functional equivalents for the Indian lunar mansions. But once the planets um, appear in Indian literature, they, they are treated effectively as deities, as, as deva. There's the Navagraha, which include the seven visible planets, the sun, the moon, the five visible planets, and Rahu and Ketu. Rahu originally was the ascending node of the moon, and Ketu didn't mean the descending node of the moon. Ketu meant comets. One of the original meanings of Ketu in Sanskrit is banner or signal. And so the Ketu were collectively the comets of the sky, and they were considered one of the Graha. But then later, sometime perhaps around the 7th or 8th century, it was redefined as the descending node of the moon. And you sort of see this also parallel uh, in translations of Indian literature into uh, Chinese. And so once you have the introduction of esoteric Buddhism, which in the West is often known as Vajrayana, esoteric Buddhism, and uh, so this sort of system of Buddhism is different from earlier traditions because it relies heavily on the performance of rituals, the production of mandalas. Those are illustrations of all the deities in a systematic fashion, as well as mantras, uh, incantations uh, that you recite, such as Om Mani Padme Hum, as well as mudras. These are hand gestures. So you have this large ritual theater that uh, is uh, codified in these scriptures and you have to execute it according to a specific time. And so one of the major texts that was translated in 724 was the Varochana Abhisambodhi, and it was translated by Shubhakara Simha, an Indian monk, and Yixing, a Chinese monk. And the text says that the mandala has to be produced at a specific time. However, it doesn't specify what, what exactly an auspicious time is. Indians at the time would have been able to quickly um, determine what's an auspicious time based on their own astrological lore. The Chinese didn't have access to sufficient amounts of Indian astral lore at the time. So in any case, this, this text was very complex and uh, a lot of the elements were unfamiliar to the Chinese. So Shubhakara Simha Yixing produced a commentary to it. And part of the commentary deals with the definition of auspicious times. And it mentions things such as the lunar mansions, the zodiac signs, the seven days of the week, and other features of hemorology um, for determining auspicious times to carry out rituals. Um, however, th there's not sufficient information in the commentary in order for a Chinese monk to really uh, make a, a schedule for performing these rituals. Uh, the responsibility for producing an authoritative manual of astrology in Chinese for Buddhist purposes was, fell to a later generation, and that was a Moggavadra. And so he produced a manual of astrology, which in very accessible terms in Chinese uh, describes um, how to carry out uh, rituals at auspicious times. And it, it also translates things in a way that's comprehensible to somebody familiar with the uh, Indian or somebody familiar with the Chinese calendar. But this text also says that you can also 
um, carry, you can also recite certain mantras and carry out certain pujas, that is to say rituals, when things are inauspicious. And it also goes into natal astrology to some effect as well. So we'll say that an individual born under this lunar mansion at this certain time might face various obstacles or misfortunes, and they, they can um, recite mantras and carry out pujas to alleviate those forces, those influences. But it doesn't give the details, it doesn't provide the mantras. Nevertheless, uh, around the same time too, you have Indian monks translating into Chinese uh, various other texts that actually do start giving you the mantras. And it does describe the pujas, the rituals that you perform when the lunar mansions and the planets are inauspicious. And so this sort of becomes a, 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 a uh, widely practiced uh, form of astral magic in China. So this is around the mid 8th century to late 8th century. And then around that time too, horoscopy, that is to say the casting of birth charts was introduced into Chinese for the first time. So in this case, it's probably coming from Indo-Iranian sources, and we can make that guess based on the fact that there's Sogdian loanwords in the relevant literature in Chinese. Sogdian is an Eastern uh, Iranian language, but it's, uh, their astrological literature was probably derived in large part from Middle Persian, but presumably also some translations of Sanskrit literature. So it's probably best to characterize it as Indo-Iranian. Now with horoscopy, you have the promise that you will have misfortunes in life. Any astrologer will sit down, look at your birth chart, look at your transits and say, okay, well, you're going to face all these misfortunes in the future. And there was obviously an interest in mitigating some of these forces, mitigating some of these negative unwanted influences to counteract the forces of the Navagraha. So they also introduced... Um, forms of astral magic which seems to stem from Iranian sources and these are basically um, I guess you could call them just rituals and prayers directed at the planets there's no production of talismans per se but there's pr production of icons so for example there is a uh, widely attested ritual uh, to Saturn and you have to cast his image with the iron made from a plow and so Saturn is associated with agriculture, so it makes sense to produce this, uh, this image of Saturn from plow iron. And you have to do it at a specific time. And you also have to burn a specific type of incense. In Chinese, it's an xi xiang, which um, there's two definitions of that. One of them is um, styrax benzui, which is imported from Southeast Asia. And then the other one was, would be um, gugulu, which is a uh, resin from India. Interestingly, in the Picatrix, it also says that you can burn um, um, Styrax, although it's not the same Styrax as what you find in Southeast Asia. Hmm. The type that's found in Southeast Asia is often called Styrax today, but it's not the original Styrax from the Near East. But Picatrix also says that you can burn um, Delium, which actually is the uh, Latin name for the Indian Gugulu. So there's a lot of common features in this literature that we see in Chinese with what you see in the Picatrix. Uh, for example, you also see red sandalwood in the Chinese being burnt for Mars. And then Picatrix also says red sandalwood. Uh, Picatrix says red metals. And then the Chinese says uh, red copper. Um, also things like honey for Venus, sweet substances. So a lot of the, the astrological lore that we see in this uh, astromagical literature in Chinese in the late 8th century, early 9th century, it very clearly is coming from a common heritage with the Picatrix. It's not the Picatrix, obviously. It's not um, talismanic magic either. There's no productions of talismans, but you'd still have to carry out the prayers, the petitions, and the rituals. Some of them can be fairly complex as well um, at, at, a, at, uh, at a, the appropriate time. And so this, this sort of magic was introduced also into Taoism. So the, the Buddhists adopted this foreign astral magic and, and they incorporated their mantras into it. And they also incorporated some of their deities into it, such as Teja Prabha Buddha and uh, Avalokiteshvara. And then the Taoist side, um, the early versions of the Taoist astral magic have less um, blatantly or patently um, Taoist elements in it. And it seems they just reproduced it verbatim from the uh, translated literature. 
So it's, uh, it's, it's very fascinating to see that you do have um, a lot of common features with what you see in the Arabic and later Latin worlds um, when you compare things to the Chinese. And that's predictable, though, because the horoscopy that you see in East Asia, for example, the mainstream horoscopy in China was based on material probably translated from Middle Persian, and it was probably Dorotheus of Sidon, or material mm -hmm. based on Dorotheus of Sidon. It probably wasn't the same text that uh, Al-Tabari translated into Arabic, but uh, the Chinese were operating with a lot of principles of Hellenistic astrology, such as triplicity ruler, sect. Um, they were using whole, whole sign configurations. And uh, in general, the, the horoscopy that you see in, in medieval China um, the first wave of it uh, was clearly coming from uh, the Near East. So it's also predictable that you would also see uh, the magic also coming from the Near East because astro magic um, always accompanied, yeah, astro magic always accompanied uh, horoscopy. Also, the iconography, too, it's very fascinating. The iconography, um, they're very similar. So, for example, uh, in East Asia, you have uh, Saturn depicted usually as a as a as a, an, as an old man with a dark complexion, and he's hunched over, and he's holding a cane. And in some instances, the cane um, actually has a sort of sigil or a sort of sickle-like um, symbol at the top of it, and that's very similar to what you see in the uh, Arabic and Persian depictions of Saturn. And the other planets, it's very similar as well. Um, for example, Venus always holds a loot in China and Japan. And then that's also what you see in the Persian descriptions. Venus is always holding a loot or a guitar. So yeah, this, this astral magic that you see in China uh, came from the Near East, although it doesn't have the talismans uh, that you see very well developed in texts like the Gayat al-Hakim Picatrix. Right. And even in, in there, there is kind of a distinction between the more sacrificial type of rituals and the talismanic rituals. I think that's more something that people started mixing together later, um, like using right. those rituals to consecrate their talismans, for example. Right, yeah. And also in China, too, there is an element of sacrifice. So, for example, the one attested ritual to Mars, you have to extract blood from a, a, a brown donkey, a red donkey. So... Uh, there's also a certain amount of blood magic, which, which actually, interestingly, would have been taboo to the Taoists at the time. The Buddhists wouldn't have done this, at least not the mainstream Buddhists. Maybe some of the underground occult kind of um, experimental Buddhists might have done this, but the Taoists um, would have considered this taboo. But you do find the uh, bloodletting of the donkey in uh, the in the one ritual from the probably the late ninth century, early yeah late late ninth century, early tenth century. Are there vegetarian alternatives? Uh, the Buddhists would have probably practiced this magic without any bloodletting or uh, like, for example, it's, it's it's the Taoist version of the Saturn ritual. It says that you, you don't use horned vessels because you're avoiding bulls because bulls are associated with Saturn in this literature. And you also don't eat beef. You don't eat uh, bovine meat. And, but the reason that you don't eat bovine meat is that you're trying to avoid the gaze of Saturn. You're trying to avoid the influence of Saturn. So you're pushing those out of your life to midi mit mitigate any sort of Saturnine influences in your life. The Buddhists would have looked at that and they would have just said, okay, good. We have to be vegetarian. Don't eat beef. And you're doing this for good merit. Right. So, so the Buddhists in China believe that if you don't eat meat, it's meritorious. It's good karma to avoid eating meat. That's probably true. <laughs> Now, uh, what about the Confucians? How do they fit into all this? Do we have anti-astral magical polemics from the Confucians, sort of in the way that we would have from, say, Stoics in the West? The, the native tradition of Chinese celestial omenology is very old. It goes back to, like, like deep antiquity. And then the Chinese imperial dynasties also had their own forms of, um, I guess you could call it astral magic rituals directed at the asterisms. Although the mainstream forms of these rituals um, were carried out toward the native astral deities. So you have, um, for example, the Qinglong, the, the green dragon of the East. And there's various other constellations that uh, they offered rituals, uh, sacrifices. So that form of magic is entirely indigenous and native to China. And as far as the court records go, they didn't incorporate any of this foreign astral magic. 
Now, from their perspective, if they would have seen somebody carrying out a sacrifice to Saturn or to Venus, for example, they wouldn't have seen that as taboo or out of the ordinary as long as it wasn't threatening the state. But astrology was widely studied. And uh, interestingly, it was also legally tolerated, too, because technically, according to the Chinese laws, a private study of astronomy was forbidden. But in order to carry out horoscopy, you actually have to have like ephemerides and have some astronomical knowledge. But with the breakdown of uh, the central government's authority after the Anushan Rebellion in the 750s, it seems that the government stopped enforcing those rules. But they also didn't see it as a threat because astrology is pretty much oriented around individuals. I think as long as you weren't casting the horoscope for the emperor, but basically... Most common people wouldn't have had any idea exactly when he was born. That would right. have been considered top secret knowledge, and only the court astrologers would have known that. Hmm. So maybe we could talk about the syncretism of the astral deities. Uh, you mentioned this this dragon. Maybe we could expand on that a bit. Yeah. So there's there's the the native Chinese constellations, which also go back to deep antiquity, and they also saw them as uh, deities of heaven at the same time and when it says sacrifices it seems the literature is implying that there was blood sacrifice which was part of uh, the chinese court culture they would um, sac you know based on the ancient rites and the protocols they would um, kill animals and they would sacrifice the meat and also feast upon it so it's very similar to the polytheism of uh, the western world as well of antiquity so that's sort of uh so basically, the, the Chinese viewed the stars as divine, and Polaris was especially important to them because they saw that as like symbolically also representing imperial authority. Because if you, if you stand and you look up at Polaris, you see that all the stars circulate around it. And so Chinese imperial architecture was also oriented on a north-south axis as well. And a lot of the symbology in that architecture, which also carried over into Japan to some extent as well, reflects uh, the sort of uh, astral hierarchy. And so just as the emperor is Polaris and all things rotate around him in good order, um, uh, you know, so too can you sort of reproduce that harmony and that order on Earth. And Chinese celestial ominology, which is strictly concerned with the uh, well-being of the nation, well, well-being of China, not so much other nations, um, it also goes back into deep antiquity and it was very well developed over the centuries. And so whenever there was sort of anomalies in the sky, in particular comets, but other things too, so falling stars, meteorites and so forth, that was interpreted uh, based on the established canonical lore. So the Chinese, Chinese imperial authorities took celestial omenology very seriously. And it seems too that toward the ninth century too, that there was an interest in horoscopy because horoscopy, unlike native Chinese um, omenology, um, can predict the, the future of individuals. So that would have been of interest to court officials, the emperor and other people as well. Did these questions about determinism affect philosophy in the same way that that it was affected in the West where people began to criticize astrology because it infringed on free will. Is this, is this an issue that we can see uh, across the Eurasian continent? Well, there was challenges to the legitimacy of astrology in India, but that's separate from what you see in China. The Buddhist tradition, as I've pointed out in a paper in the Journal of the International Association of Buddhist Studies, JIABS, I pointed out that basically Buddhists from very early on, the early literature until the end of Buddhism in India, always display a sort of passive interest and acceptance of astrology, which is interesting because you also have the law of karma, that your future and your future lives and your well-being um, is all determined by your actions. It's up to you. So how exactly does astrological determinism work with that? And, Effectively, what I point out is what I point out is that um, there was still this sort of passive belief in astrology. It's just sort of an environmental factor that Buddhists believed in, and there was only a few isolated cases of Buddhist literature that actually criticizes astrology. But when you look at the Chinese literary record, there seems to be almost no serious criticism 
of astrology in the medieval period, and there was less discussion about free will. My impression is that unlike in the Islamic and Christian worlds, the whole issue of free will was not a, an issue in Chinese philosophy. Um, it, wasn't an, it wasn't an issue for Buddhists or Taoists either, because the whole idea of fate is also an important element in Chinese philosophy from early on, like Confucius talked about the nature of fate as well, and that you know things are just fated to happen. So they avoided absolute determinism because they did believe that there were means you could undertake to alleviate or to mitigate uh, the worst of prognosticated disasters. Um, so there was just sort of a passive acceptance of astrology as far as I can tell. And I haven't actually seen any sort of critical discussions of, or even discussions where the author is trying to metaphysically explain the purported efficacy of astrology. There's just none of that. I, I just don't see that. There was just sort of an acceptance amongst people that it works. Right. There's no Plotinian debate about whether stars are signs or causes. It's just, they, they so, somehow it works. Somehow it works. It works. Yeah, And I, I generally they would have perceived it through a polytheist lens because the planets are depicted usually in anthropomorphic forms. So they're gods and goddesses. And yeah. you, can, you can somehow interpret their influence on your life through um, reading the stars, but also the days of the week. So when the, the seven-day week was introduced into China, it became mainstream in the 8th century. They just saw it as like, okay, well, so on this day of the week, um, so uh, Mars is active. Mars is, this today's a Martian day. So Mars is, is the Mar, Mar, Mars is, is, is active in the world today. And so you avoid certain things and you do other things. So did they use the system of Ptolemaic dignities or not at all? Well, Ptolemaic astrology was only introduced with Islamicate astrology in the late 14th century. Okay. So the astrology that we see in China from around the year 800 is more or less based on Dorotheus. So you do have, for example, the triplicity rulers, the terms, etc., cetera, um, the decans, et cetera. That's, that's all there. Um, but uh, you don't see Ptolemaic astrology into the late 14th century. And even then, although it was translated as the al Mukal. Um, it didn't seem to have made a very big impression on Chinese uh, horoscope because in the subsequent centuries, we see very large texts on horoscopy. And I've started to excavate some of these, like, for example, the work of Wan Minying. And you see some sort of vestiges of the al Kal in Chinese translation being reproduced in the Chinese horoscopic literature, but the Ptolemaic worldview wasn't adopted in the Chinese world until maybe the 17th century when you have the Jesuits translating uh, basically um, the condensed forms of the Tetrabiblos into, into Chinese. And it's interesting because they had to uh, sort of interpret things through this Ptolemaic uh, lens. So they would use the Chinese vocabulary to describe like, you know, moistness and humidity, <laughs> et cetera. But that sort of worldview of the planets never became mainstream. They just continued, I think, viewing even after the al was translated, they just viewed the planets as gods and goddesses. Did they try to hook it up to, to Chinese medicine and do these sort of one-to-one -one elemental correspondences and things like that? In, in a nutshell, no. But uh, now this is interesting because I did publish a paper in Asian medicine and I, it, the whole t idea is that astrological medicine was practiced in China. Because you can actually tell based on what the astrological literature in Chinese is actually saying, it's, it's predicting illness and it's also diagnosing illness uh, based on people's birth charts and, their, and the transits of the planets based on their birth charts. Now, when I submitted that paper to the journal, I got two peer reviews. One of them was positive and the other one was very negative. Mm -hmm. They didn't think astrology belonged in this journal at all. This peer reviewer pointed out also that... Uh, this astrology never had any sort of discernible impact on mainstream Chinese uh, literature dealing with medicine. And that's perfectly valid. That's actually correct. But what I point out, though, is that there's still astrologers practicing medicine, even if it's fringe, even if it's not considered orthodox medicine, it's still being practiced. And we should recognize that this form of healing, this form of diagnosis was still being practiced, even if it wasn't considered medicine. Um, by the orthodox authorities at the time 
So it's like if you were going to write a history of 20th century um, medicine in the world, well, you could neglect all the faith healing, but then you'd also be neglecting an important cultural component of the whole process of healing, even if it's unscientific yeah. and even if the, you know, scientific authorities reject it, but you should at least mention that, well, a lot of people attempted to heal themselves based on faith healing. And similarly in, in medieval China, people consulted astrologers and astro astrologers predicted and diagnosed illnesses. So there, there was astrological medicine practice based on the uh, astrological literature available to them, but it wasn't, uh, based on Ptolemy. So, cause Ptolemy, Ptolemy is only really ever mentioned in, in Chinese for the first time in the late 14th century with the translation of the al Kal. Right. And Abu Mashar also probably just as obscure. You know, the, the astrological authors that, that you would be familiar with if you were in the uh, Islamic world or the Latin world, uh, those would have been all unknown in China because the literature what happened in China too was that the early horoscopic literature was translated and the original authorship and origins of a lot of it was lost. Mm. It was, for, I wouldn't say lost, it was just forgotten. And some of the attributions are very curious. Like it's just some, some nebulous um, Brahmin from the Western regions came and introduced this literature, which is just probably a cover story for um, the original translator who probably didn't want to identify himself <laughs> for whatever reason. Or it was, I think in some cases too, there was just a commercial motivation too. And we only have so many manuscripts available to us of uh, the astrological literature of the uh, late Tang dynasty in the 8th, 9th century. So a lot of that literature too is limited and we're only probably looking at a small fraction of what was available. And, but even then the sort of, it was, it was often treated as a utility too. So people would just recopy the material, but they might not include the uh, original, um, the, the original colophon the title, the authorship and everything. They just took what, what they needed from it and then, you know, pass that down and then people would recopy the same material. And then you, you end up with the sort of uh, uncertain line of transmission over the centuries. So did any of the more philosophical or theoretical material that usually comes along with the magic ideas like the hermetic perfect nature or the overarching structure of platonic cosmology how did these ideas interact with the cosmologies of the dharmic religions if at all there was virtually none of it yeah <laughs> it's interesting because uh, that's a very big difference between the astrology of east asia and west asia is that the east asians treated astrology as utility and the magic was seen as perfectly practical. Um, for example, you know, Saturn is making this very harsh transit on your chart in the um, upcoming year or next three years, right? So you carry out this puja regularly, and it's just to mitigate the influences of Saturn in your life. The Buddhists would have saw astrology as, as practical in your daily life, and but as far as liberation and liberation from samsara, liberation from suffering, and the attainment of these higher states like Buddhahood and so forth, astrology is, is less important for that. From the esoteric perspective, you have to carry out the rituals at astrologically auspicious times, but the um, actual liberation from samsara doesn't include any sort of astrological components. The mandala that you see in uh, Japan, which was carried over from China, the uh, Taizokai mandala has the planet zodiac signs and lunar mansions but they're in the outer ring of the mandala they're in the you know the, they're furthest away from the center in the center is vairochana buddha the cosmic buddha but the the uh, heterodox deity is also including you know indra and ganesh and brahma and also all of the lunar mansions and planets they're all on the outer rim so they're part of that cosmology but they're not key to um, liberation from samsara hmm. and then presumably can liberation come about through bhakti because there is you know dedication to certain gods can the planetary gods grant you liberation no no, no. they can't but that being said too buddhism historically is is often concerned with uh um the, the mundane affairs of life as well and getting through this current lifetime and all the hardship of it so buddhists 
practice the generation of merit, so good karma. So you, you give to beggars, you release animals which are destined or condemned to be slaughtered, and you produce images, you recopy scriptures, etc. But the astrology side of that, there's, there's, no, there's no sense that that can lead to liberation. And as a result of that, modern scholars of Buddhism have often just dismissed astrology and Buddhism as some sort of anomalous accretion that shouldn't be there. And so up until very recently, <laughs> basically until my article pointed out, basically nobody in Buddhist studies has really discussed what astrology means for Buddhism, like the actual study of Buddhism. And I pointed out that you do have astrology in Buddhism, but why aren't we talking about it? If you look at the Encyclopedia of Hinduism, if you look at the history of Islam, Judaism, Christianity, there's all this discussion of what astrology meant for these religious traditions. But for whatever reason, Buddhist studies and the scholars of Buddhism have just neglected this, um, this topic. Because it doesn't fit in with the ultimate telos. Yeah, the teleology. Yeah, the telos of Buddhism is liberation from samsara. And practically, astrology has very little to do with that. But it's still part of Buddhism. Now, somebody asked me at a conference, they said, well, what's so Buddhist about a Buddhist astrology apart from that Buddhists practice it? Well, I point out that like, for example, in the monastic codes, in some contexts, it says that you have to like establish um, the foundation of the monastery when it's auspicious um, based on the lunar mansions. Well, there you go. That's mm -hmm. like an essentially astrological component to the monastic code. It's a small part of it, but the monastic codes aren't, strictly speaking, conducive to liberation from samsara. You know, the monastic codes are meant for an orderly organized monastic institution. Um, that alone doesn't get you into samsara, that doesn't get you out of samsara. So what's so Buddhist about monastic codes other than Buddhists have all these rules about how to run a monastery? That would be my counter argument. So it's, it's, it's Buddha, astrology has always been a part of, of, of Buddhism. And I think the scholars of Hinduism are more likely to recognize the significance of astrology in uh, various Shaivite and Vaishnavite traditions. And it's also probably too, because in the modern day in India, if you go to India, um, Jyotish is, is widely practiced and Hindus um, will usually consult Jyotish astrologers um, for whatever, for whatever, you know, uh, cause they have, for example, marriage or for starting a business. Um, and so also Buddhists in the 20th century have generally uh, rejected or ignored astrology, despite the fact that in a previous century, a lot of their predecessors would have taken astrology more seriously. So modern Japanese Buddhism, for example, uh, they tend to focus on sort of the philosophical side of um, their traditions as well as the history as well as meditative practices and so forth and ever since the Meiji restoration in the late 19th century um, Japanese um, Buddhist authors and scholars have tended to focus more on a sort of rationalist perspective which would have been quite alien to um, their predecessors in earlier centuries especially the scholars of Shingon and Tendai because in earlier in earlier centuries, the whole esoteric Buddhist uh, tradition also, um, you know, dealt with astrology, specifically the timing of rituals, but other aspects of astrology as well. So, yeah, so we we have to kind of develop this discussion more in uh, the study of Asian religion that astrology is a part of these traditions today, and it was a significant part of these traditions in the past as well. Right. Um, so now what about Iran? Um, how does Zoroastrianism fit into all this? Uh, I don't know if it's, if this is a correct assessment, but I get the sense in Zoroastrianism that all the planets are essentially malefics. There's just, <laughs> yeah, that's, all, that, that's true. That's true. They're all out to get you. And you kind of get a glimpse of that in Abu Mashar. Um, but I wonder to what extent that idea spreads eastward so the foremost authority of zoroastrianism that i know is antonio panaino at university of bologna and i've uh, read his work in detail and as i understand it yes the planets are understood as demonic because they don't follow an orderly course of motion 
Uh, the fixed stars, however, are benevolent and they're associated with Uhura Mazda. Uh, so the planets are considered demonic. Now, what's interesting, too, is that the planets are still named after the chief deities of the Zoroastrian pantheon. So Jupiter is Uhura Mazda. Yet Uhura Mazda is treated as a demon. What that goes to show you, though, is that there was multiple transmissions, reinterpretations of astrological lore in Iran over the centuries. So probably early on, the form of astrology that reached Iran was Hellenistic. And so they probably just um, adopted... Hellenistic astrology um, in its in its uh, form at the time, and so they would have named planets accordingly after uh, after their deities. Well, it probably would have been earlier than that. I mean, the Zoroastrianism would have inherited the astral pantheon of the um, Mesopotamians. So you know, Marduk in uh, the Mesopotamian religion is Jupiter, mm -hmm. but but then late in later centuries, when Hellenistic astrology is being developed, that also was transmitted into Persian. Um, possibly as early as the Parthian period. Although it's interesting because there, one, one could also surmise that because there were so many Greek speakers and lit, people literate in Greek and Greek learning in the Iranian world, both in the Parthian and Sasanian periods, that there was probably a, a certain degree of like astrologers operating in Greek at the time. Um, but what we know about Zoroastrianism now is based on fragmentary evidence because a lot of what we know about Zoroastrianism is based on what Arabic and Greek authors wrote about Zoroastrianism inscriptions. And then you have like the Bundeshin, the creation myth, but that's from like the ninth century. And that's from the um, Islamic period of uh, Iran when the Zoroastrians have, have uh, you know, uh, lost their status as a state religion and there's fewer and fewer of them. But going back to the original uh, question, uh, I don't think Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism had a specific influence in East Asian astrology. Um, however, what you do see in some contexts is the planets, whether they are benefic or malefic according to Hellenistic definitions, they're kind of all treated as potentially malefic. Mm -hmm. And that could be a sort of vestige of um, Zoroastrian thinking. But then we have to keep in the take into consideration too Manichaeanism as well as Gnosticism as well. Um, in East Asia, you'd, you'd want to take into consideration Manichaean conceptions as well. But then also in India too, the Navagraha um, can also be seen as, uh, you know, all, all of them, all nine of them can be potentially disruptive. And so you have Dharanis that you recite in order to mitigate their influences in your life. Uh, could you talk about the Manichaeans? Because uh, as far as I know, even up until the 20th century, there were laws in Chinese uh, or law codes banning the Manichaeans um, and in Vietnam as well, if I'm not mistaken. Well, Manichaeanism was um, abolished and a lot of and the priests were executed in 845. Um, by Emperor Wuzong, who also went on a rampage against the Zoroastrians and the Christians and the Buddhists as well. It was a short-lived reign, but nevertheless, he um, obliterated the foreign religions as best he could. But uh, Manichaeanism was present in China from, actually, it was probably present from, in China probably from very early on, but the, you know, the first records of it and the Chinese interest in it is, is more or less from the 7th century, so the Tang Dynasty. 7th century until 845 when Wuzong uh, destroys the uh, Manichaean church, but he also destroyed the Christian church as well. So a lot of our understanding of Chinese Manichaeanism, it's also based on fragmentary evidence, such as um, the sort of fragments of, Ma of Manichaean literature that was found in Dunhuang in the Northwest in China. There was a cave of uh, various texts from different traditions in different languages that got sealed up and it was rediscovered in the uh, you know early 20th century. So our knowledge of Manichaeanism in China, China is also fragmentary. I don't really know if there was, strictly speaking, a Manichaean like form of astrology that was in China. I think it's more likely that you just had like Indian and Iranian forms of astrology that were marketed and practiced in the capital and some other areas in China. And it didn't necessarily have to be associated with a specific religion, because again, it's being treated as a utility. It's like not 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 like there's necessarily, strictly speaking, like Indian medicine or Iranian medicine. 
at the time. There just would have been medicine and that's how it would have been treated at the time. Yeah. It's just the practical approach to it dissolves all of these theoretical speculations that make it uh, learned or esoteric or anything like that. Right. That's precisely it. So was there ever kind of a reverse Orientalism or Occidentalism, uh, whereby the more Western something was, the more mysterious and mystical it was? Or are these just useless concepts? Well, definitely, definitely. So there's one uh, text that was preserved in Japan, and it's, uh, it's a Buddhist manual of horoscopy. Although it says that all of this knowledge was um, brought by this uh, Brahmin of Western India, it's uh, clearly not because half of it is sourced from Chinese texts, but it's not citing the original source. So, for example, the Ephemerides in this text, even though the text claims that they came from Western India, the Ephemerides are Chinese. And uh, we actually know which calendar they were adopted from, uh, adapted from. Uh, the astronomical parameters in the text as well are Chinese. So Chinese use uh, 28 lunar mansions and altogether the ecliptic is divided and the celestial equator they're both divided into 365.25 degrees Hmm. so that's a characteristic of chinese astronomy whereas the mesopotamian indian uh, number would be 360 degrees so you see some of these interesting uh, attributions to western sources when it's clearly not but again i think that whoever composed this text was probably interested in selling it so if you could claim it came from a western source then you could probably find somebody to pay top money for it Hmm. right just like in the west you could say the same about the wisdom from the east and in in tang china in tang dynasty china there was definitely um an interest in in things from the west and uh you know the caravans the monks the clerics all these different people coming over there was people who had money would spend top dollar to get access to these people and things especially things like uh various aromatics that uh, weren't available in China, um, medicines, and then also things like astrology, any sort of uh, rare Buddhist texts that hadn't been translated yet. These sort of items too would have been um, very commercially valuable. Hmm. So historiographically speaking, what's the role of David Pingree in all of this? Oh, David Pingree. Well, he never touched on China because he didn't know Chinese, but the whole history of astrology from, in his words, I think Baghdad to Bukhanar, um, it's uh, very important because he was the one who really fleshed out the history of astrology, especially in Asia or Western Asia anyway. Now, a lot of his, a lot of his theories have been contested, but keeping in mind that he's an early pioneer of the field of, you know, critical studies on the history of astrology, um, his work still holds up fairly well. Like, for example, he also dated one of the early uh, Indian horoscopic texts, the Yavana Jataka, to the uh, third century. But then uh, Bill Mack pointed out, based on uh, manuscript evidence, that this dating is uh, probably wrong and that the text could be dated uh, much later, potentially, or possibly even earlier. So when we're trying to flesh out, though, what is happening when foreign astrology is being transmitted into China and you're looking at the Indian, Iranian and later Islamic sides, then you have to um, read David Pingree's work um, in detail. David Pingree was also an Indologist, so he also looked at the Sanskrit literature and uh, his work, too, when he examines the history of the Indian calendar is very useful when we're looking at the uh, the Buddhist uh, calendar and Buddhist astrology in East Asia, because then you can sort of date things uh, more critically. So, for example, if you see zodiac signs, then you know that's much, much later because the zodiac signs weren't part of the original Indian calendar. Yeah, if I could jump in here regarding uh, David Pingree and his work with manuscripts, he was always very fond of saying how, uh, uh, pointing out the huge volume of astro of Sanskrit astrological texts that remain unedited, unstudied, unread, and I'm wondering whether the same applies to China in your experience. Definitely, there is vast, vast amounts of astrological literature in Chinese. Some of it was part of um, traditional canons, the Taoist canon, the Buddhist canon. 
Uh, and some of it is part of the corpus of texts that was uh, compiled in the uh, 18th century in China, um, sort of the imperial library. And uh, there's, so for example, there's the literature on horoscopy, which is quite extensive. And then there's also the literature from earlier centuries that deals with court omenology. And that's, that's barely been touched in European languages, more so in, in modern Mandarin, but then it hasn't been really studied as a, as a field onto itself. Um, and although I guess the main difference would be that in China, a lot of this, a lot of these texts are part of sort of official libraries and, and corpus, corpuses of texts. And so there's sort of like old typeset editions of them, or there's woodblock prints of them that are, you know, widely available. Whereas the Indian side, there's a lot of manuscripts, which are still like paper manuscripts that are like hundreds of years old. And often they're not in the greatest condition. And, you know, you have to treat them with great care and try to photograph them in order to preserve them for the future. So there's, there's definitely a lot of literature. Astrology is one of these fields that has been neglected by the modern humanities because you can't really fit it into science because the scientists don't want anything to do with it normally. The religious studies people don't think of it as religion and the theologians don't want to deal with it either. And then you can't really fit it so much into history either because it's, it's very technical and it's dealing with things that aren't directly related to historiography. So I'm hoping that in this century, you know, scholars such as myself and you and other people as well can sort of create a sort of field onto itself, the sort of scientific academic study of the history of astrology. Because there's a lot that can be said about the cultural, cultural transmission lines and, you know, interactions between different peoples of different languages, different religions over the centuries. Yeah, it's like when people chalk these artificial departmental divisions, they really throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Like, could you imagine if you went to a religious studies department and you said, I want to have intro to classical astrology as a course here, and I'm going to teach it? <laughs> so, some departments might like the idea. Yeah, but they wouldn't bat an eyelash if they said, I have to learn such and such language or, you know, Coptic or something like that. Right. So you're, you, you, could, you could propose studying like, you know, Coptic manuscripts, and that's fine. But if you want to do classical astrology, I think a lot of, I think the animosity toward astrology, though, is also just a reflection of um, the widespread prejudice against it. It's something that both like highly religious and highly science oriented people both seem to hate. So Richard Dawkins bashes astrology, but then the theologians as well will bash astrology. So how does uh, astrology sit currently with the communist party? Oh, well, they don't really seem to see it as a threat. They just sort of, I think probably they just sort of see it as a harmless superstition. So astrology in, in China, there's widespread interest in it today as well. It's widely, it's widely marketed online too. I have a friend actually, professional Chinese astrologer, and she seems to make good money off of uh, doing uh, the charts for her clients and interpreting them. They don't see it as anything that would be subversive to state interest. And then in Taiwan, where they have religious freedom guaranteed, there's all sorts of divination, every conceivable form of divination available. So it, just in, in terms of uh, survival of manuscripts, I had a bit of a follow-up in terms of how, uh, by your assessment, how bad was the damage done by the 1966 to 76 cultural revolution in China to the survival of these materials? The astrological literature, I can't say with great certainty. The Texts that were preserved in official libraries and corpuses of texts, which would have been reproduced, you know, hundreds at a time as woodblock prints, even thousands at a time, those I don't think were ever lost. However, we do know that during the Cultural Revolution that, you know, they would go into some of these uh, Buddhist monuments and uh, take all of the old Sanskrit texts and throw them in a pile and burn them. We don't know which texts those were necessarily because they hadn't been... Um, documented or, or at least the documentations relating to them weren't preserved. So we don't know which ones were in those uh, monuments at the time. There could have been some astrological texts um, that also got torched, but we don't know for sure. Okay. So I just wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts on current projects and so what are you working on now? Do you, do you have any projects on the horizon that you wanted to talk about? 
Sure. Well, my present project right now is looking at medieval Chinese accounts, secular and Buddhist of foreign polities. And I'm interested in what the Chinese knew about the Sasanians in particular. I'm also looking at India and also the early uh, caliphates as well. And so this also includes, uh, you know, the history of diplomatic relations, trade relations, and then also by extension to knowledge transfer, both astrology and medicine. So I'm excavating all of this material and looking at uh, various sources. There's a lot that can be said about the Chinese relationship to the Sasanians. Often people talk about how the Peros, after the collapse of the Sasanian dynasty, fled to China. That's very well known. But then there's a lot of other things that are said about the Sasanians and the early caliphates that have, haven't really been discussed in uh, modern scholarship. But in the future, what I would like to do is get collaborations between scholars of different traditions of magic and astrology, um, specifically in the medieval period, and really start to collaborate and try to establish the common heritage. So if we were to look at Gaia Talakim and the Arabic material, correlate that with Agrippa and Latin Picatrix, and then also compare that with what we can see in India and then also in China and East Asia broadly, then we can probably start kind of looking at, well, what is common to all these traditions? And if we can get very specific to, well, which aromatics are associated with which planets? And, you know, we can start to really flesh out what was sort of, um, what was common about these traditions and also uh, what can we say about cultural transmission that might be unrecognized now um, going from the you know Near East to the West, but also from the Near East to the Far East, right? We want to discuss these lines of knowledge transmission and also what it means for the interactions between these different um, cultures and civilizations and what sort of strategies did translators use, for example, to translate astrological um, vocabulary into different languages. That's another thing that could be discussed. So ideally, in the future, we could maybe get some sort of government-funded uh, project that would look at um, this topic in, in great detail and bring together scholars from different uh, backgrounds to discuss these matters. I hope that that works out because there's so many different ways that the subject can be approached. And it's like we said, it's this problem of chopping things up into different disciplines, it means that we never really get a holistic picture of the subject. But uh, these kinds of studies would definitely help on that um, as much for religious studies as for social history. Yeah, social history and also history of science to some extent too, because you could look at how, um, you know, different traditions approach some of the more scientific aspects of the astronomy involved. Um, those sort of features too would be interesting to to track and to trace over the course of time. And I think it would, it's just a fascinating subject as well. But as I said, it's, it's hard placing the history of astrology and also magic into any sort of existing framework. Religious studies, I've argued that we should just treat astrology as religion. And just then we don't have to try to argue that it's science or that it should be treated as science. But then again, you end up will get you'll end up with a pushback from people more oriented toward theology, and they would say, "Well, astrology is not religion." Yeah, even though Augustine and all of the most important theologians all dealt with it, right? And th then, in their argument would be that, "Well, it's an anomalous accretion, and it's not inherent <laughs> to the tradition, so therefore we don't have to take it um, that seriously." Yeah, which is. But then, if you but then you look at the Syriac literature that I've looked at in translation, I'm like, there's a lot of astrology in, in this literature, like the, the book of medicines, for example. Um, so it's like, you know, there's discussions of God in it. And then there's also discussions of astrology. So clearly it was in, important to them as well. Yeah. For Ficino, definitely astrology was just part and parcel of being a priest and a philosopher. It just was something you did because that it was part of medicine and right. if you're a proper priest then you're also a healer and, and a healer is a an effective physician who needs to make accurate prognostications and choose proper elections for treatments and things like that so i think i think one of the hardest problems of uh, modern scholarship is that we don't necessarily distinguish between prescriptive and descriptive yes so often when you're reading for example about a given religion, what you're reading is a prescriptive 
form. Like this is what the religion is supposed to be according to the scriptures and the authorities. But then there, you could have a descriptive where, well, this is actually what people do. It's like if you were to do a description of, um, for example, Buddhism, like, you know, if you, if, if you read the Buddhist scriptures and the monastic codes, well, then you'd have this impression that you have all these neat orderly monks who, you know, don't look at women and they're completely 100% celibate and they don't touch gold and they walk in an orderly line and they barely ever speak and they meditate like 13, 14 hours a day. <laughs> You know, just like the Franciscans in the in right. the 15th century, yeah. But then, if you look at the actual record of Buddhists, for example, in in, in India, you see that they're money lenders, they're running caravans, they're married. Sometimes their wives live with them. <laughs> it's like it's a very different world from what a lot of modern scholars have painted. You get the impression that like you had all these Buddhist monks who were like you know philosophers and. Uh, you know, sitting in this sort of countryside in front of stupas, preaching the Dharma to these, you know, students and lay people. But <laughs> you find that, no, they were lent lending money to people. And some of the the uh, authors of drama and even some of the critics of Buddhism, too, they're like pointing out that Buddhist monks in monasteries are flirting with the maids. Huh. That makes me think of Erasmus's In Praise of Folly, which is just all about the monks of his own day and how they're all fat and drunk and they divert money from the actual poor people right. and great criticisms all around. And they could, I mean, this just as applicable as it, then as it is today as well. Like, yeah. you know, if you, if you go, if you go to a church, they'll give you like a manual on what they're supposed to be. Right. But then that's very different from how people actually are. Mm -hmm. Or even who wants to be around those people. You know, if you're right. totally unapproachable, then you're going to have a hard time finding new recruits. Right, right. Well, it's also, I mean, you have to take in, I think we have to take into consideration, you know, social class. And uh, like, for example, if you're like an eminent monk at a major Indian monastery in the medieval period, you might be a prince even, right? Mm -hmm. And you have a bunch of girlfriends. You think they're going to kick you out of the monastery? <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> you, need you, that you, endowment. They Not just the endowment, but it's like, yeah, there could be retribution if you... Uh, if you kick this guy out of the monastery. So historically, I mean, I, I, I've, I've seen it in the modern day as well in my travels and my experiences as well. There's, there's what people are supposed to be doing according to their religious scriptures. And then there's what people actually do. Yeah. And what, what people actually do is, is just regular human consistent behavior. Yeah. And then life comes out somewhere squeezed between that matter and that form. Right, right. So I think if we were to approach astrology or the presence of astrology in different religious traditions as descriptive rather than prescriptive, then it'll be a much more fruitful discussion in the end. Yes, I think so. Same thing with magic too. Like we know that there were all these people practicing magic based on picatrix in Europe, right? They mm -hmm. weren't supposed to be, but they, they, they certainly were. Exactly. And whether people were supposed to be or not supposed to be within the Arabic world is like a whole other can of worms right and well you see the sort of like attempts at legitimization in the Gayat al-Hakim picatrix like in the name of God for example or you see the expressions like God wills it and so forth right so trying to make it le legitimate within that religious orthodoxy all right so I think this is probably a good place to wrap things up I was going to ask you if you could list some places to uh, for people to check out your work? Sure. Well, the first place you can go is academia.edu. I have a lot of my publications on there. Uh, you can also look at my Twitter feed and I um, post updates on my work there. If you want to, you can also look me up on archive.org. I have a lot of things uh, uploaded there that you can download without registering. You can just grab the PDFs off of that. And uh, I should have a book forthcoming, um, hopefully by published by Brill sometime this year or next year. Nice. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be titled, probably titled uh, Astrology and Astro Magic in Medieval East Asia, something like that. Will it be made of solid gold? I hope so. Well, it'll be priced <laughs> as such. Yeah. <laughs> it'll be it'll be priced like most Brill books. <laughs> I saw that they had some sort of christmas tree that they were building and they, they made this christmas tree entirely out of brill books and i'm thinking like that christmas tree is probably worth something like a hundred thousand dollars yeah probably well the good thing with brill though is that 
those publications are immortal. Oh, they, and they're great. They're it's the also best. that, yeah, and Brill has been around for a long time. It survived the occupation in World War II and uh, economic upturns and downturns, and it's still kicking it. So it's if, if you publish with it, it'll still be available 200 years from now. It's also the first thing to go on to the uh, special websites made by the special people. Yeah, <laughs> that's also because if you have a subscription, they let you download PDFs. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, I think Brill probably makes most of their money nowadays, probably from like university subscriptions to Brill Online. That's that's my guess. They make a lot of these like Oxford, Cambridge and so forth. They probably make a lot of money just off of uh, university subscriptions. So the piracy doesn't really put a dent in their final profits. All right. So that's probably a good place to stop. Thank you for joining us. A pleasure hope to have you back on sometime in the future. So thanks a lot. Thanks so much.